Greetings, everyone. This is the Alternative Guy back here again with another video. Uh, today's video is going to be a continuation of uh, the last video we did on slavery and the making of the new world. For those of you that didn't see part one, part one, we basically dealt with the sub Sahara slave trade. So today we're going to deal with the transatlantic slave trade. And this one is going to be bringing us up to date and it's going to uh, really get into some details. Uh, we're going to get into some details about the whole transatlantic slave trade. And again, um, we're back here with my brother, uh, brother Muhammad Salam. Um, Brother Muhammad, can you share some information with those that didn't see the last program or some of the other programs that we've done on history? So if you want to share a little bit about yourself um, to bring everybody up to up to date about who you are and what you're all about. Uh, again, my name is Muhammad uh, Ali Salam, and I am a proud graduate of uh, two uh, significant uh, black uh, schools, Snow Hill Institute, uh, which was founded by uh, one of the first graduates of Tuskegee Institute under Booker T. Washington, who encouraged his students to go forth and establish uh, schools for blacks who were badly needed uh, coming out of slavery. And I also uh, graduated from Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, which uh, where I studied under Dr. Lorenzo Green, a protege of uh, Carter G. Wootson, the founder of the Black uh, History Week, which uh, matured into the Black History Month. I am uh, always glad to be here with you, Brother uh, Hashim, and I look forward to our undertaking today as a continuation of the subject of uh, uh, slavery and the making of the new world. Last uh, time we dealt with the uh, sub-Sahara trade and uh, this time, uh, as you uh, mentioned earlier, we will attempt to cover the uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade. Okay, now we know we have a lot of people out here uh, today uh, 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 kind of like wanting to dismiss or saying that, um, you know, the transatlantic slave trade didn't exist. And so we want to cover some of that area. You know, we want to cover that and try to clear up some of that. So um, let's start with uh, the first question is, uh, what's the difference between the trans uh, Sahara tr slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade? Well, first, I would like to say that for those who tried to dismiss the existence of the transatlantic slave trade, I think the same thing should be done to them that the Jewish community is attempting to do to people who tried to deny uh, that the Holocaust existed. Uh, there is no uh, question of the existence of the transatlantic slave trade. And again, uh, pointing out the difference between the sub-Sahara uh, slave trade and the transatlantic uh, slave trade, uh, the former of which we covered pretty in depth, I thought, the last time. Uh, I think it might be more uh, significant to distinguish the difference between the Atlantic slave trade and the 
transatlantic slave trade, since that this is the area that we're covering today. Uh, now, the Atlantic uh, slave trade uh, uh, represent uh, the Portuguese who ini initiated the Atlantic and the transatlantic slave trade. It represented the Portuguese going into West Africa and bringing slaves from West Africa into Europe, uh, into Portugal and, and selling them and even selling them in, uh, all through the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, now that is the Atlantic slave trade that is going from Africa into Europe. Now, when you began to take slaves from Africa across the Atlantic Ocean into the Americas, then you're talking about the transatlantic slave trade. So the Portuguese, as we said in our previous subject, preceded the uh, Spanish in liberating themselves from Moorish rule there on the Iberian Peninsula about 250 years. So the Portuguese was out and running. Uh, the Portuguese were free from Moorish rule in 12, around uh, 1249, I'm um, estimating, why the uh, Spaniards didn't completely free themselves until 1492. Nonetheless, we might say that the Moors had uh, lost control of the Iberian Peninsula or of Spain as early as the 13th uh, century after the uh, El Moravids and the El Muhadis, the Puritanicum African uh, groups who came and I, I, I was tempted to use the word, uh, uh, push the uh, Spaniards back, but they didn't push them back. They halted their advancement. So about the 1200s, the only stronghold left for the Moors was to the south uh, in Granada, where the famous Masjid El Hambra, or the Mosque El Hambra, was built. And we know that it was Ferdinand II who uh, led a battalion uh, that conquered uh, Granada in 1492. Uh, now, so we have to look at now that they have freed themselves of Moorish rule. And we have to understand that during this period, uh, prior to the expulsion of the Moors, that the Europeans were basically locked within. And there was really no concept of a Europe at the time, but they were locked into what you would call today Europe. Uh, they didn't have access to the Mediterranean Sea, nor did they have access in the knowledge of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so after they freed themselves of Moorish rule, now we see a determination on the part of these Europeans never to be locked up again, not to go forward again. So we can think of Christopher Columbus are really unlocking the European and freeing them from their isolation in the world. Now there's an account to a, the Royal Chronicle of the Portuguese in 1441, whose name was uh, Gomez uh, Zorara. And according to uh, uh, Gomez Zorara in 1441, a young Portuguese sea captain uh, by the name of Anton Goncalves, uh, led a crew of 21, and he was accompanied by another sea sailor, young sailor, uh, whose name was uh, Anton Tristol. They went uh, down into Africa, West Africa, and they were in search of seal skins and oils. And after they had uh, achieved their uh, uh, plight, uh, uh, Goncalves called a meeting that night and said, how much more would we please the prince, speaking of Prince Henry the Navigator, if we was to take back to him even more precious cargo, referring to African slaves. So that night they went past Cape Blanc between a peninsula separating 
uh, uh, Western Sahara and Mauritania, and they captured two Berbers, a man and a woman. And Tristau and his delegation, they conquered 10. And so they uh, brought them back to Portugal and presented them to uh, Henry the Navigator. And Henry the Navigator was impressed, not so much by the quantity, but the possibility of uh, this future uh, trade in human bodies to the Portuguese economy. But these two Berbers, a man and a woman, propositioned him and said that if you take us back home and free us, we will show you how you can get even more slaves. And these would not be Berbers. These would be Black Africans. And so we uh, trace uh, this as the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade. And so they brought these slaves back. And now uh, the Portuguese had also colonized what is called the Micro Micronesian uh, archipelagos, which is to the uh, far west of the Atlantic Ocean. They are considered by the Titanic plate to be in Africa, but politically today, they are considered in the uh, European Union. And the four most conspicuous of those are the uh, Azores uh, Islands, uh, the Madeira Islands, Cape Verde Islands, and the Canary Islands. And so they had colonized those uh, islands and they were also bringing those slaves back uh, into those islands. And they had began to uh, cultivate sugarcane in those islands. Uh, so so what, what type people, what, what people were they? They were considered African people? Well, they were African people, yes. These islands, some say, were uh, isolated. Uh, and they had, when they began to bring these Africans out of uh, Guinea, they brought them and placed them in these islands for the cultivation of sugarcane in these islands. As a matter of fact, it is from the Canary Islands that Christopher Columbus left when he took his voyage, when he landed into the New World. Those winds there in those islands are more conducive for navigation. Now, those islands are immediately south of Portugal. And Portugal, as we know, is in the North Atlantic Ocean. And uh, so this is the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade of bringing Africans back from Africa into those islands and into Europe. Uh, now, we also see a, another uh, important event is that Portugal had been moving into Africa before Spain was liberated from Moorish rule because as early as during the uh, Battle of the Castilian uh, Secession uh, between uh, 1475 and 79, we see the Battle of Guinea in which Spain moved into Guinea and captured some of the Portuguese uh, gold and slaves. And it was at this treaty that ended that war, it was called the Treaty of El Calcobes, that said that Guinea belonged to Portugal. So that restricted Spain uh, somewhat from going into uh, West Africa. And then we see another treaty two years after Columbus made his voyage uh, into the Americas, the Treaty of Tordesillas. Mm -hmm. In the Treaty of Tordesillas, because Spain and Portugal now are uh, conflicting over the dominance of the Atlantic uh, Ocean. In this treaty, they carved out a line in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, west of Cape Verde, and literally said that everything east of this line in the world belongs to Portugal. And this you might uh, define as the beginning of that age of exploration of the age of European conquest. And everything west of this line belongs to Spain. So this is one reason we see that Spain did not, in the African slave trade, Spain did not take slaves out of, well, they might have stolen a few of them, but generally, 
They did not participate in bringing slaves out of Africa because she was restricted by the Treaty of Tordesillia from going into Africa or into Asia through the Atlantic Ocean. And again, this is why Baboa and Magellan went west because they, and when they, uh, Baboa saw the Pacific Ocean and Magellan went through what became known as the Straits of Magellan and went as far as the Philippines where he was killed. This is why they took that route because they couldn't go uh, into Africa nor into Asia through the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so uh, Spain now between uh, 1492 and I say uh, 1540, Spain had colonized uh, half of uh, South America Everything in South America except Brazil, you know, Portugal uh, colonized Brazil after Pedro uh, uh, Cabral conquered, uh, uh, conquered uh, Brazil in 1500. So the Spanish empire in the Americas encompassed half of South America, expanded the Caribbeans, most of what is today Central America and much of North America, if we, when we include uh, uh, Mexico. And Mexico at the time, as we know, included Texas and all of that land that came out of the Mexican-American War, which went all the way to the Pacific Ocean and included uh, California. Uh, so, but Spain needed labor and Spain had by that time nearly worked the Native Americans to death. And many of the Native Americans had died from diseases that uh, the, they didn't have immunity from these European diseases. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it is said that within a century and a half, nearly 80 to 90% of the Native Americans had been wiped out by the European. So Spain had this broad empire in the Americas, but yet she had no access to Africa. So the question is, how are you going to get slaves to supply these colonies as a labor force. And we have to also uh, recognize this concept of the encomienda, and I was trying to make this applicable to what I'm saying here. This concept of encomienda, this word encomienda means a trust in Spanish. And when the Spaniards uh, took uh, Spain from the Moors, they incorporated this concept of encomienda. Encomienda is where as one of the reconquistadors was given a encomienda, and he is considered an encomiendero. He was given the label of the Moors who they had conquered. So they extended this system to North America, I mean, to, to Latin America. And so- Brother Moore, yeah. can you, um... At this point, can you explain to our, our audience um, the Americas? You know, because see, a lot of people are thinking that a lot of this whole slave, all of this transaction, kind of like the transatlantic slave trade took place. When they talk, when they talk about America, they think thinking basically of the United States of America. So, can you right. elaborate on that and kind of tie that in with what you're saying? Well, I think we already have when we define the extent of the Spanish empire in the Americas. And when you say the Americas, and at this time, there was no such thing as the United States of America. Right. Uh, the first colony in the United States was Virginia, and that was 1607. And so the Spaniards and the Portuguese was out on a run in the Americas long before that. But the definition of the Americas would include the two continents, North America, which includes uh, Mexico today, the United States and Canada. And you're talking about Central America, which comprises seven countries today. And you're talking about the Caribbeans. And then you're talking about, again, South America. And when you talk about South America, Brazil now is half of South America and Brazil belonged to the Portuguese. So uh, the Spaniards only had half of South America. And Brazil was a very lucrative uh, colony for the Portuguese and for those who came behind 
uh, Portugal, like the Dutch who took it from Portugal in 1630. Uh, so uh, we go back to this concept of encomienda here in the Americas, uh, but uh, there was a Spaniard, a conquistador by the name of Barcelona de las Casas that took pity in the Native Americans. And he went back to Spain and advocated for their liberation. And he said that the Spaniards were abusing them. And he received a sympathetic voice from the crown. And so generally they liberated the remaining uh, Native Americans from that system. So now you have no means, Spain, of supplying a labor force uh, for this broad Spanish empire. So what Spain did is that they sold a contract which was called the Asiento contract. This word Asiento is from the Spanish word sentado, which means to sit. Uh, so what Spain was going to do was to sit back and sell a contract and let other nations and other companies uh, vie for that uh, contract to supply its uh, colony uh, uh, his colonies with slaves. And so Portugal was the one, first one to own this contract. So the slaves, the first slaves that were brought into the Spanish empires in the America was brought by the Portuguese. And we know that uh, Harlem also had this contract. We know that the British had this contract. And we know that later on, we see that even the New England colonies and states of the United States even uh, acquired this contract in supplying uh, the uh, Spanish colony uh, with uh, slaves. I hope I answered some of your questions. Oh yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that, that clarified it, yeah. But I think another thing we uh, uh, need to mention in the context of this is that in uh, 1452 and 1455, we have the Pope, Pope Nicholas V, given ecclesiastical justification to the European conquest and the subjection of the dark people of the world to European or to Portuguese or to Catholicism, to the authority of the Catholicism. And in that papal bull, Nicholas uh, V rendered to King Alfonso V of Portugal, and he had instructed him and gave him the authority to go forth in the world and to subdue the subjects and to bring them up under your authority, bring them up under the authority of Catholicism to take their property, to take their land, to take their provinces until they submit to the authority of the Catholic Church. And this was uh, reissued in 1555. So they have not only the royal authority to do this, but we see that the involvement from the very beginning in the Christian church at that time in the West, the only Christianity that was, was Catholicism until Martin Luther's uh, Protestant Reformation, which began in around 1517. And we, that was a conflict there. Uh, with, because the Dutch wasn't here in there. They were the Protestants and the English. They weren't paying no attention to none of that. Okay, so that's why, like, um, so the Anglican Church came, they broke away, right? Yes, they broke away. Uh, but uh, Anglican... all of it is, is being done under the umbrella of Christianity. Right. All of their colonization and enslavement is being done with the justification that they have the divine right uh, by God to conquer uh, and to subject people to their authority. And we see this today, the outcome of this today you see in Latin America, the dominant religion is Catholicism, and that's how it got there. And we see here in the United States, the dominant religion is Protestantism, because it was the Protestants who dominated over here. So around the world, even in the Philippines, where you see the dark races uh, under uh, adhering to Christianity, 
It is a result of this era of European exploration of which I like to call the European uh, era of conquest and the precursor to Western imperialism. Okay, so what uh, European nations conquered specific areas of the Americas and what was the economic benefit for these, um, these people that rule these areas in the Americas? Well, initially it was, as we said earlier, Portugal and Spain. And uh, we see that uh, during the period of the Protestant Reformation, we see uh, the Dutch, uh, Harlem, uh, breaking away from the Habsburg Spanish authority uh, in the 80 years war and uh, asserting their Protestantism to an extent, but really Harlem one of the reasons Harlem was successful because Harlem was not a, a strict adherence to religious authority. It is the first secular uh, nation, you might say, in Europe. And so uh, the uh, Harlem was more uh, concerned with profits than they were with, I would think, say, enslavement. And so Harlem, after they had freed themselves from Spanish authority, Harlem went forth uh, and began to conquer. And one of their uh, major conquests was that they took uh, Brazil from Portugal in 1630. Uh, uh, and then we uh, look at also the, the British and the British began to take uh, much of the Spanish uh, colonies uh, also. And the British took the Barbados and after uh, uh, Brazil, the Barbados became the leading uh, colony in sugar production. And sugar was a very important commodity because the Europeans now are just becoming uh, familiar, you might say, with sugar. And so, as a matter of fact, in Christopher Columbus' second voyage back to Spain, he brought back sugarcane plants from the uh, uh, Cape Verde Islands. And in Hispaniola, he planted those sugar cane. And then uh, two years later, he shipped them back to Spain. And they saw that they could have a lucrative market in sugar cane. And uh, so uh, Hispaniola, Hispaniola today would be uh, the two countries of Haiti and Dominican Republic. It became a very lucrative uh, market in sugar production. And so uh, it was, uh, uh, in uh, Brazil that the Portuguese had a very lucrative market in uh, sugar and uh, Harlem conquered it in 1630. They stayed there until about 1654. But, the, uh, but Harlem was so successful with sugarcane production that <clears throat> they began to invite the English into the industry and even help the English. They even financed the English endeavors in the Barbados, even showed them how to uh, plant and how to harvest, how to cultivate sugarcane and how to transform it into sugar. And the British undermined them and then began to take over the sugar industry. And in, in 1655, the British conquered uh, uh, Jamaica from uh, Spain. And Jamaica also became a very lucrative market in sugar. And uh, so this sugar uh, cane was produced. It was milled in the colonies over here and the sugar was shipped back into uh, Europe and where that sugar was sold all over Europe. And it was a very uh, a lucrative uh, a product and also tobacco also. And so uh, we see in 1697, we see the British uh, after uh, not brilliant, but France after years of battling with uh, uh, Spain, we see the British also taking over the island of uh, the Western uh, island of Hispaniola, which became Haiti. And that became a very lucrative market in sugar. And we know that that is well uh, later in 1791, the great Haitian revolution occurred. So sugar was so important to the French economy that Haiti 
that <clears throat> because of that revolution and taking the sugar off the market, that the France economy almost collapsed as a result of that. Uh, and then we see also the tobacco crop in uh, Virginia. And this is what made Virginia was the tobacco crop in Virginia when Virginia was established as a colony. And because uh, around 1630, Virginia was importing uh, to uh, some uh, million tons of tobacco into uh, England. Uh, there's an a interesting account that uh, James uh, Malvin gives in his book, uh, Black Ivory. And he was talking about these uh, coffee houses that had become very popular in England. And he said that when you went into these coffee houses, these coffee houses was the place for the uh, elite in Britain, uh, the uh, wealthy people. And he said, when you went in those coffee houses, it was filled with smoke and they were drinking coffee, sweeten with sugar and they were uh, drinking cocoa. And he said that uh, everything that they were indulging and consuming there was uh, produced from the backs of slavery. And I said that if he waited a little later, he could also include it the very clothes on their back, which had been uh, uh, transformed into clothes from cotton picked by slaves in the deep south uh, of, of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very uh, good example of how these people uh, uh, performed no work at all, that everything that they were enjoying then as to date is a result of taking from others and even in the labor of others and enjoying the fruits of other people's native lands and even uh, their labor. And so when we start talking about these various commodities that they were exporting back to Europe and throughout the world, we must understand in terms of the slave trade that the very first commodity was the commodity of the African slave himself because the African was made into a commodity. He was made into a thing, an object that could be brought, bought and sold and profit derived from his very body and made into a commodity and later into a chattel, a thing, not a human being. And they could feel very justified in doing this is because they had uh, declared him as subhuman, not a human being. And so they could do this. And they had done the same thing with the Native American and with all the indigenous people that they encountered as they went forth in the world. Now, in terms of this, there's another uh, phrase or terminology I like to uh, talk about is when the Spaniards first freed themselves in the Iberian Peninsula. And this phrase was called limpieza de uh, sancra. And in Spanish, it means the cleansing of the blood. And it was a precursor to the Inquisition there in Spain. And it was an exercise to determine who was a pure Castilian or who was a pure blooded, in essence, Caucasian, and who was not. So this is really the precursor of, in my opinion, to modern racism because modern Spain was founded out of an act of, of racial cleansing, uh, uh, the idea of the purity of the race. So as they went forth throughout the world and they encountered dark skinned people, they felt very justified in what they did to them because they were not Caucasian people. Also they had um, religious, sanctions also to um, support that too, right? They exactly, had, yeah. exactly. Because to be a Christian, to be a Catholic in their concept uh, before they began the conversion and the conversion of the dark skinned people to Catholicism went hand in hand with the subjugation mm -hmm. of dark skinned people. So it really wasn't a conversion to the Christian religion. It was a subjugation. It was not them accepting it through a pure 
a belief or a pure investigation into any Christian principles, but it was a subjection to a religion with the sword over your head. Well, all of them was pretty much like that then, right? <laughs> all of the religion. To a, to a heavy degree. Yeah. To a heavy degree, all of them, the major religions, right. was uh, penetrated through uh, the uh, decimation of indigenous cultures. Right. Uh, now, something you had mentioned, and I wanted to go back on, you had mentioned about these um, commodities that like the sugar and the tobacco, right? Right. So now we look at, we, you know, come up to date, and we look at that those two commodities are killing people more than any other commodities that people consume. And that was their major, their major thrust was to, you know, have these commodities and import them all over the world and get people hooked on it. Because you got people hooked on sugar today, and then you got people hooked on tobacco, you know, cigarettes and stuff today. So uh, I'm just looking back. Uh, that's just something that popped in my mind about these these commodities that they were really um, it made them powerful at the same time, but it's also was killing people. You know. Well, uh, you might also define it as the age of death and poison, because the uh, death and the harm to the human being went hand in hand mm -hmm. with the poisoning of the earth itself. Because if you look at sugar and what sugar does to the soil, it is the, uh, detrimental to the soil and thus is detrimental to the human being because we eat from the earth. If you look at coffee, coffee is also detrimental to the soil. Now as to whether it has any health benefits to the body. Uh, if the soil is poisoned, then what comes out of the soil is also poison. Uh, even cotton, uh, cotton is detrimental to the soil. In fact, it wasn't until the time of Dr. George Washington Carver that he told these people that they needed to practice co uh, crop rotation and stop uh, planting and harvesting cotton redundantly, that they were depleting the minerals uh, in the earth and everything that they planted of these major commodities, that's what it did. It was depleting the earth of its natural minerals. And so they were doing the same thing to the African slave. They were, uh, the idea was that it was cheaper, to, it was better to work a slave to death and get another slave. And it was the same idea of the soil. You work the soil and you destroy the soil and you move on, they kept going. And this is how they got in, into what is today the United States from uh, Latin America. They just kept going. As the uh, uh, song says, uh, from the halls of uh, Montezuma uh, to the uh, to uh, 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 Tripoli, they yeah. just kept going from, uh, the, from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. They just kept going and they kept poisoning both people and soil as they went. And today we are looking at an earth that is highly polluted. And now they are talking about the danger of this and will human life be possible in the future? But they forget that the inception of this poison began with their so-called age of exploration, which they like to glorify so much in history. But they don't like to talk about the damage that it did to human beings and to the soil, which we are suffering from today. Yeah, that's um, that's really um. For an example, it wasn't until around 1960s that they start uh, 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 the, the medical profession start warning people about the danger of consuming too much sugar, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't until what the 1960s that they even start telling people about the danger, cautioning people about uh, uh, cigarette smoking. When they first started cigarette smoking, even the doctors were advertising about the health right. of, of cigarettes of smoking. Yeah. Uh, so it was all about marketing 
and profit. It was from the beginning. It was about profit over the value of human life and the value of uh, the earth uh, that we had been blessed with and we were supposed to be the caretakers of. And this is what the indigenous people was before the coming of the Europeans. They were husbands, good husbands of the earth and uh, taking care of the earth. And this was a new phenomenon that never was seen before. And it continued throughout the rule of the European uh, world of the planet earth. And now we see them trying to take that madness all the way into the heavens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't so so this um this topic that we are on um called slavery and the making of the new world, then we can see how we got into this situation that we're in now. Because a lot of people don't look back and don't want to study history and to see how we got into this situation that we're into. So that's why we need brothers like you to help bring us up to date because most people don't like reading most people don't like studying so uh, we have um we're gonna show that's because they've been lied to <laughs> yeah and some, something in their subconscious told them that, that this is a pack of lies so they began to reject education as they call it or indoctrination uh period uh, and uh, i mean the human being is not stupid as an innate intelligence in the human being and so he i think that innate intelligence tells him the, uh, a fraud when, when he's encountered by one and so you can keep on ruling and believing that as abraham lincoln said you can fool some of the people some of the time but you can't fool all the people all the time uh so perhaps we didn't have the power to overthrow this nonsense but nonetheless we remain i think conscious of what was going on. And this is what frightened them. This is why they made such a, uh, a blatant effort in indoctrinating uh, the human being uh, under the guise of education, because he didn't want you to know exactly what he had done and what he is doing, both to humanity and to our home, the planet Earth. Well, let's, let's, let's tie that uh, whole idea of the critical race theory in with this because it appears that, you know, a lot of, a lot of we, you know, people are getting a lot of kickback about when they want to talk about this history, the real history about how this, all of this stuff came about. And now you have people kicking back saying, oh, no, no, we don't want to talk about that now. We, 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 that's over. So how do you feel about that? You know, well, I think with the uh, uh, murder of George Floyd, I think people uh, were waking, uh, and it, it was budding uh, long before that. I think it was budding. And this is not just Black people. This is many white people, too, that are fed up with those lies. So when you see a lot of the white people who are opposed to this uh, critical race theory, uh, you, there's a, a, a quite a bit of white people who are also in favor of the truth being told because I believe that uh, uh, the, the white people might have been put in the dog uh, even more than black people were because it cannot operate if white people are enlightened to the truth. Uh, but I, I think that the time is right now uh, for uh, the people uh, a heightened level of consciousness. And I think they are very fearful of this of the truth being told about uh, uh, that this was not a glorious age. It was a glorious age in terms of it birthing of modern capitalism. And uh, as we know, the industrial revolution that occurred during this period also uh, was a result of uh, the, the transatlantic slave trade. And uh, all of these things need to be known the relationship between modern capitalism, the industrial revolution, and uh, that had it not been for slavery, that would not have been uh, modern capitalism. And if it hadn't been for slavery, that would not have been an industrial revolution. Uh, so uh, 
you would have had to take your time in your development and your growth, but it's best to do it a natural way than to push forward so quickly and abuse both the earth and humanity. And that uh, live the natural way is what we people were doing. Live the natural way. Uh, just because you can make a, a thing or create a thing, it does not need, mean that you should make it. Uh, I think you should consider what are the social implications of it before you uh, invent something. Uh, what, are, what is the implications to the human family uh, before you make it? What is it gonna do in terms of the relationship between uh, male and female? Uh, so uh, this is what they do. They, they define progress by things, by objects, and not by the uh, qual quality, qualitative relationships of human beings. So it, this, it appears that the Europeans and I, I don't, I don't want to generalize all of them, but it, I'm talking about the ones, the, the ones that's in power, the, the corporations, and all. It seems like uh, they don't have any limits as far as how far they would go to uh, accelerate their wealth and their power, and to stay in control. It just seems like they don't have any limits. And they have proven this. Uh, they have proven this quite well. That if you, uh, this is why uh, they are so uh, prepared militarily mm -hmm. and scientifically, uh, and how science now is being used uh, in a as an instrument of destruction of the human being, and also as a, a continuation of the destruction of the Earth itself. And so uh, it, it seems as if they're willing to destroy the whole world, the whole earth, uh, if their power is taken out, uh, is undermined. Uh, there's no way for them to stay in power. But we have to remember that there is also a natural power uh, that is beyond their power and that they exist only because uh, perhaps uh, every uh, Every race uh, is given a time, a period of time, as out of the mercy uh, of the creator. Every uh, race, uh, every people is given a period to show how will you rule, how will you behave if you are free to do as you please. And uh, the saying is, if you want to know what a person is really like, free them and let them do as they please. And so this might be defined more as a test upon them because they have been free to do as they please. We haven't been free to do as we please. We, uh, we don't want to make just, justification for our errors, but we can, the dark people of the earth can say that we have been up under European indoctrination and power. But I'm wondering what excuse do they have because they have been free to do as they please. And we are looking today at the outcome of them doing as they please. And it do, does not look too favorable. Right. Okay, so um, let's kind of wrap it up with, um, so what, what's, what do you um, think the, the relationship was between the indigenous uh, Americans and the, I guess you would say the African. Yeah. African, African slaves? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, because there's a lot of controversy around the, the two people and how they merged. And, you know, so what do you think was uh, that relationship all about and how, how we should see the connection? Well, I think that this uh, controversy is a uh, rooted in the fact of them ignoring uh, <clears throat> the history between the two people from the very beginning. Uh, there's a word in Spanish, it's called cimarron. And in Spanish, cimarron refers to a wild horse, a wild horse that cannot be tamed, cannot be broken. 
So when they, the Spaniards brought the first slaves uh, over here, at least the Portuguese, for them, uh, these slaves right away ran into the mountains, into the hills, and they made an alliance with the remaining Native Americans. And now, when the French came in contact with them, the French referred to them as the Maroons. And uh, some scholars say that when the British came in contact with them, they named them the Seminoles. Now, this movement of the Cimarrones, or the Maroons, it spread all through the Americas. Wherever Black slavery existed, this movement uh, was, was prevalent. And one of the most dominant forces of it was there in Brazil, in uh, El Salvador, in the Bahia, the great slave revolts there, uh, and the Palmeiras. Uh, now, and in Jamaica, in the mountains, the blue uh, uh, mountains uh, in Jamaica, and all the way in the bayou, bayous in Louisiana, uh, a leader by the name of St. Malo, that word Malo in Spanish means bad. So they was calling him the bad saint. He was a black man. And he led the battalion, uh, and he and his uh, come, uh, patriots freed themselves that ran into the bayou. And dad, the slave masters that come in there, not only, but they went back and liberated other slaves, particularly women. And this movement was all again over the Americas again. And they couldn't control this uh, movement. And this movement in Jamaica even facilitated how the British was able to conquer Jamaica from uh, the Spaniards because of the battles, the fierce battles that the Maroons were fighting against the Spaniards. And then when the British took over Jamaica, uh, the British could not control the, the Maroons. They were only able to somewhat put them under authority when the British went to Havana. And in Havana, the Spaniards had began to raise these vicious hounds. They were called by one author, the Hounds of Hell. And they were raising these vicious hounds simply for the purpose of bringing uh, rebellious slaves under control. And it was only through the importation of these hounds that they were able to defeat the Maroons there in Jamaica, the British that is. Uh, but there was a very uh, early, beautiful relationship between the Native American and the African slave. It was so fierce in the beginning that uh, Avando, Avando was the third uh, leader of the Spanish uh, conquistadors after Columbus and Bahi Dila. And uh, he even advocated the abolition of the slave trade in the Americas because these African warriors were so vicious. They were not here at Hera to slavery. Uh, so that was a very beautiful relationship. And this relationship uh, lasted all the way into what became the United States, as we covered uh, earlier in one of our programs. Yeah. So this is a modern thing in the Indian nation and the split in that relationship between the Native Americans and the uh, 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 African um, slaves and their descendants. Okay. Oh, yeah, we want to encourage uh, our viewers, if you haven't seen um, the show that we did uh, on this channel, it was called uh, a, Neglect a Neglected History of Indigenous Black Indians. Uh, we would we encourage you to watch that also. Well, Brother Muhammad, uh, is there anything else you want to cover? Um, uh, about this whole idea of slavery and the making of the new world? Uh, no, I think uh, generally it's a very broad subject and uh, it would encompass volumes and volumes and volumes of book, which it already has. So it is hard to cover these subjects in such a short uh, period. But I hope uh, to our viewing audience that we did give somewhat of a synopsis and a general outlook of what is falsely called the age of exploration. And to uh, understand that this was the precursor to modern Western imperialism and the age of European conquest. 
after they had been let loose from Moorish rule there in Spain uh, and uh, coming into the Americas, which was about the only uh, part of the world left for them, which they could come into. So which, which um, uh, do you think the Sub-Sahara slave trade or the Sub-Sahara trade, which one of them would you think was most harsh, the harshest toward human beings? Without a doubt, the transatlantic slave trade because what the transatlantic slave trade did is that it defines the black man and woman as subhuman beings, which we are still tackling with today. It identified slavery based upon skin color. Prior to that time, it was no such thing. And we are still dealing and wrestling with that issue today that you are viewed as a black person, not by as Martin Luther King said, uh, by your moral fiber or by your principles or your uh, uprightness, you but you are right. viewed by your skin color because you are black. Right. And we, we uh, until that has been eradicated, and this is a very, as Alex Tocqueville, the French political philosopher, came to the United States in the early development of the United States, and he, do, he did a study of uh, American democracy. And they very interestingly tried to get him out of the country before he had the opportunity to observe slavery. But he insisted that he had to view the slave first. And in, in his observation of slavery, he made the following statement. He said his pity was not for the slave that he was viewing, but his pity was for his descendant because while you can legislate slavery, you cannot legislate skin color. Mm. And so that is what we are still wrestling with today. And around the world, we are seeing uh, this tendency in the dark world to try to lighten themselves up. And the black race have been trying to make themselves lighter and lighter and lighter because of the pressure and the difficulty of uh, seeing yourself as a worthy human being in the white world as a black skinned person. This is not only happening among the black race, this is happening among even the uh, people in Asia, the people uh, of the Native Americans, all people who are not white are trying to move themselves toward uh, what is called in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, 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 I think the word, I can't think of the word, but the word is, is, is where the, the Puerto Ricans that were talking about how they, Puerto Rico was, uh, its cultural background or its ethnic background is that of uh, uh, Native American, the black slave, and the European. And how they were talking about the mestizo, the mulatto, and how the mulatto is always moving to identify with the European aspect of their ancestry and denying the, uh, the African that is in within them. And why the, uh, the black African, of course, is everybody is trying to move toward what is called the, the Blanco mentality. They're trying to move toward the whiteness while the whiteness is just sitting still uh, uh, <laughs> while everybody's trying to involve, he has no, uh, worry or know nothing. Everybody is trying to circumambulate him. Uh, and so this is the pressure that has been let loose as a result of what they define as this glorious age of exploration, which is nothing but the age of enslavement and colonization and the precursor to uh, modern imperialism. Okay. It's a very, very painful experience. We're still living through it. Yeah. Okay, Brother Muhammad, uh, we're going to wrap it up with that. That was, um, that was well said. And again, I want to thank you for being on the show. And I would like uh, our uh, audience to um, 
you know, if you want to give us some feedback, if you have any comments or 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 disagreements, and you can put it, uh, you know, you can put it in your comments. We welcome them. Welcome. We welcome whatever you bring, and we take full responsibility of what was said on this show. So again, uh, continue to watch and uh, do subscribe and uh, share this with your friends, your family, and um, we'll see you on our next video. All right, peace. Peace, my brother.